everyone, it's Sari, and I'm live right now here at our Valencia campus. And I just wanted to say that whether you're joining us through YouTube or Facebook, any other digital channel, we're so glad that you call Higher Vision Church your home. Now let's tune in to Pastor Jared Ming's latest message from our series, Reach. You know, uh, we're excited today because we're in a series called Reach. And I want to invite Pastor Mark uh, McGaffin to come on up, our student ministries pastor. Will you give him a hand as he comes? I want everyone to pull this brochure out. Will you do that? If you did not get one of these, the ushers are going to walk up and down the aisles and have these available for you. So just wave your hand. If you don't have one of these Reach brochures, um, just as they make their way up and down the aisle, wave at them and they will get one to you. Guys, I see some over here. I see some here, over here. So they're, they're getting their brochures ready to go and they're going to make their way. As they do that, it says Reach. And that is our city, our nation, and our world. Every year in the fall, as a church, we make a decision that we want to help and reach into the world. Jesus said that we're to go into the world and make disciples. And so we do that through missions. We do it locally. Um, one of the ways we do that, if you look through this brochure, you'll see some of the ministries we support that we partner with. Like, um, for instance, Bridges to Homes, which is a ministry that provides beds to people that are homeless. We also uh, help feed the children. It's a program that provides food to families that don't have enough food. They can actually come and shop for groceries for the week. We support things like Light of Hope, kids that are addicted and struggling with substance abuse, the pregnancy center, and so on. In fact, one of the local things we're doing is we are um, providing meals for the homeless on Thanksgiving. We're asking for 70 people to give at least $15 so that we can take care of 70 people at Bridges to Homes. They're opening up, and we're going to provide a meal for them on Thanksgiving. And then 150 meals at Santa Paula. So if you give a gift um, and you, you make that notated on your giving envelope, just say Thanksgiving Outreach, we'll do that. We actually are already about 60% there, so we only need about 40% left. You can also give by bringing in jackets Go to Walmart someplace, buy a couple jackets, bring them and put them in the bins. We need 70 new jackets and we need 70 um, blankets, fleece, uh, twin size blankets, blankets. So you can buy those and put them in the giving bins. That's one of the ways that we're blessing our city with missions. Not only that, but we also bless our nation. We give to things like our satellite campuses to take the gospel into areas like Santa Paula and Blythe. But we also give to things like church planting. We're part of an organization called ARC. And the ARC is a ministry that plants churches. Did you know that this ministry, in partnership with them over the last several years, we've been able to plant over 803 churches right here in America. Is that not awesome? Amen. But we also are called to go to the nations. And so I want Pastor Mark to share with you one of the ministries that we have, our uh, student leadership ministry, and what they're doing to go to the nations. Come on, church. Are we just so excited about what God is doing in and through your giving here? Man, it's been amazing just to hear some of the things that are happening. And I just want to thank you for your giving to missions in 2018. It helped us to send HVLE. It's our full-time internship for young adults. It was, helped us go to two different places at the same time. In the first place we went, we took a team of about 10 people to Cork Island. And we were able to partner with a ch uh, church plant there that's had little to no support for the last 10 years we're able to do things like uh, repaint their lobby and parts of their church, fix some of their parking lot. We're also able to be a part of some ministry opportunities like teaching um, in, a, in a children's ministry class. We were able to help with worship, share testimonies, pray with a lot of their students and young adults. One of the coolest things we got to do is go to street ministry in downtown Cork. And we found out that in, the, in Ireland, less than 4% are Bible-believing Christians. And so as we were walking the streets of Cork, it was really interesting being able to take the gospel to people that really haven't heard it like we we're portraying the gospel. At the same time, we were able to help feed the homeless while we were there. It was an amazing time. And at the same time, while we were in Cork, we had another team that flew to Manaus, Brazil. And then what they did is they jumped on a boat and traveled six hours down the Amazon River. And they went to uh, different villages there in Brazil. They are able to... to minister to orphans and do children's programs, worship, share testimonies. They're also able to minister to some that were bound in sex trafficking. It was a really powerful time. As a matter of fact, it was so powerful that in 2019, we're going to open it up. We're going to take another group to Brazil, um, ages 18 and up. 
and we're going to open up for the whole church to be a part of that. It's going to be an amazing time. And this year for HVLE, we have a really interesting opportunity that we get to be a part of. Uh, we're taking HVLE this year to Jerusalem to partner with a church right there in the streets of Jerusalem as well as help with their homeless ministry and see the sights of the Holy Land. It's going to be a powerful time. We really believe that um, being a part of a missions experience doesn't just touch your life for a week or a month, but we truly believe that being a part of an experience like this can change your life. We've seen it happen. And we're expecting God to do more of that this year. Thank you again, church, for your giving this year. Thank you, Pastor Mark. So these are some examples of things we're doing around the world. We're also involved in church planting in Mexico and in Africa and in, in Asia. We, last year, we were able to build an orphanage. You're going to hear about that next week in Haiti. We also built a, a church in Africa. All of those things happen because as a church family, we come together and we have a heart to reach. That's what the series is about, to reach into the world and share the gospel. And so what we're believing this year, if you look at the slide here and you look at your brochure, we have a goal of raising $200,000. Now, this is giving above normal tithes. People will give their tithes faithfully to God's house, and that helps take care of keeping the lights on. It takes care of preaching the gospel. It takes care of doing the ministry that happens all week long around here. Um, but not only that, we take part of that um, giving and we apply it to missions as well. Last year, I think we had close to $400,000 that went out to missions somewhere in some form of outreach. So our goal this year in giving, where people will commit to say, hey, I want to give a certain amount, $200,000 is our goal. And there, on the back, there's a, a sheet, and go ahead, go ahead and go to the next slide, guys. And it's a pledge sheet. And on this pledge sheet is an opportunity for you to say, hey, this is what we're going to do as a family, or as a single individual, or as a student. But we're going to give a certain amount every month, or one lump sum, sum for the year, above our normal giving, to help with missions. You could do $20 a month. You could do $50 a month. For some of you, $5 a month may be a stretch, but you're saying, I want to do something to reach maybe $100 a month, or you can write on their other. There's a place to put your name and your email, and then what you do is you simply tear that off, that pledge, take that sheet of paper, put it in the offering bag, give it to an usher, put it in the black boxes. We want to know the commitments you made. How many believe that we can do it? Do you know that if just 400 people in a church this size said, we're going to give $500 next year to missions, we would have $200,000 just like that. And so after last weekend, we're at 20,000. We only have 180,000 to go. And so we can do it together. Come on, somebody say amen. And so I'm excited about the new year. I'm excited about all the missions, things that God has called us to. Um, it's going to be exciting. Next week, you'll hear from Pastor James as he talks about some of the things we're doing globally next year. I'm excited to share with you part two of reach. And what was really intriguing is when we do this series in November, it's a series on mission. And when I was asking God, God, what do you want to say? I was surprised when he told me, preach on Jonah. Jonah didn't seem like the book, right? To preach on for mission. But then as I began to really dive into the book, I began to discover some powerful truths. In fact, this week, I'm going to share with you a principle that is a universal principle that we find in the book of Jonah. God called this guy named Jonah to reach beyond the borders and go to Nineveh and to share the love of God, to tell them that God loved them and had a plan for them. But instead of him obeying, instead of him reaching, he ran. How many know there's a little Jonah in all of us? Because God will stir our hearts sometimes to do things, and instead of reaching or instead of obeying or surrendering, we run. What I love is that, how many know you can't outrun God? And he ran into a, a storm, and, and eventually he gets swallowed by a big fish or a whale. But aren't you glad that God speaks whale? Because listen, the whale was just an ancient form of Uber. It was God's technique to get, or method, it was his miracle to get Jonah back on track so they could fulfill his destiny. Now, aren't you glad that even when we run, God has a way of getting us back on track? And sometimes it's miraculous. And so today I want to read to you what Jonah prays while he's in the belly of the whale. We're going to, next week, we're going to look at when he gets out of the whale and he goes to Nineveh and he preaches and all of that. We're going to dive into that. But today we're going to just focus on a couple of the verses of his prayer. So I want you to stand to your feet, if you will. And as you stand, we're going to read this together. As you stand, will you welcome, today we have church family joining us in Australia, Sweden, Canada, New Hampshire, Alabama, North Carolina, Oregon, Kansas, Sacramento, Oceanside, come on, that's just a few places, Nevada, Colorado. Can you welcome your church family joining us today? Wow. Pretty amazing. 
I want us to read this verse. Those of you joining us, why don't you stand as well? So Jonah ends up in the middle of the, the whale. He's been running from God, and suddenly a transition happens. He surrenders. He realizes, wait a minute, I need to call out to God and get things in right standing. And so this is where we pick up on the first part of that story. Here we go. Jonah chapter 2, verse 7. Let's read it together. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you to your holy temple. So he says, listen, when I was running, I realized, wait a minute, I need to turn to God. And so he does, and he prays a prayer, and we're going to focus on that prayer. And once he prays, watch what happens at the end. Let's read it together. Verse 10, and the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. How many of you didn't realize you're going to get to say vomit in church today? I know it's a little weird, but so we're going to dive into this prayer. And today as we pray, will you do something with me? I want us to pray for all of those who've been affected with losing their homes. I want us to pray for the firemen that are working so diligently trying to protect. Not only that, we had a horrific shooting this week. People lost family members, sons, daughters. How many know that this is what the church is here to do? We're here to love. We're here to reach. We're here to care. And uh, in fact, uh, last year when the fires were going on in Ventura, we were part of, of the process of taking waters and providing food and doing things. And so let's pray through reaching in our prayers to them, and then let's pray over this service. Father, thank you that your word says that you're the ever-present help in time of need. And today, I pray that you would be present for everyone that's hurting today, that you'd bring comfort. To everyone that is experiencing loss, that you would be the comforter. We also pray, God, that you give peace to people that are like, what am I going to do with my house and my property? Or, or people that have lost someone because of the shooting, Lord, and they're in confusion today. I pray that you'd go to them and you'd strengthen them and that you'd heal them and you'd help them in this season. Lord, we bless them today. We also pray today that you would speak to us through this powerful truth and that we would be people who don't run, but we would be people who reach. In Jesus' name, and everybody shouted, Amen. You may be seated today. I'm going to give you two points today. And as I give you these two points, here's what I want you to know. As we read through this verse, there is a powerful truth. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to end this sermon by telling you my story. Because God spoke to me this week specifically. And I want to tell you what he said to me. And I want to tell you the principle he shared with me. And I want you to open your heart today. And I want to give you two thoughts and they might sound very simplistic, but I believe there's tremendous power in these truths. If we're going to be people who don't run, but we're going to be people who reach, here's the first principle, and it's this, write it down, and that is that how do we reach? We reach out by letting go. Everybody say that with me. Reach out by letting go. I want to try it one more time so I can hear everybody. Ready? Reach out by letting go. As Jonah begins to pray, there's this transformation that happens in the middle of his prayer. And so I want to read it to you. It's in Jonah chapter 2, verse 8. Right after he said, my, my life was ebbing away, so I called out to you. What does he cry? What does he pray? Here's what he says. He says, those who, what's the next word? Everybody make a fist. Those who cling. We're going to talk about clinging a little bit today. Those who cling to worthless idols, now watch this, forfeit God's love for them. There's a powerful truth here. In fact, the word cling here is a Hebrew word that means to worship, but it means to guard, to keep, to secure. Idols, we know that's something that has moved in priority above God. And what he tells us here that's pretty powerful is that because we all have a little Jonah on the inside of us, we all are tempted to cling to something that becomes an idol. Now, I know this is a basic idea, but I want to illustrate it real quickly with the thought of you can't cling, or you can't, let me see, you can't reach if you're clinging. Now, I'll explain it. By this week, we had a staff event for our team. We do it every fall where we kind of bring the team together and we encourage each other and we kind of talk vision and we, we do some team building and spend time together. And this week, um, on the way to that meeting, I decided... Now, some of you know that I love donuts. If you've heard me talk, that's one of the things that I really love. I love crumb, uh, cinnamon crumb donuts. How many have ever had a cinnamon crumb donut? How many have ever had a donut 
How many wouldn't mind to have one right now? I mean, when you start talking about them, you pretty soon you want one. And, and so I've been really good. I've been trying to eat good, and I haven't had any donuts. But on the way to the staff meeting, I realized that I thought that the staff needed donuts. Now, there's just a generous heart that rose up in me. Now, it's kind of intriguing that I happened to make sure in the three dozen donuts that there was at least six cinnamon crumb donuts in there, but I knew that the staff needed some donuts, and so I brought them to the church, and when I opened the box, suddenly those cinnamon crumb donuts started calling my name. And so I'm like, okay, God, I think this is you leading me. I hear the Spirit saying, it's a staff day. This is for the Lord. I will sacrifice for the team. And um, so I see the cinnamon crumb donuts. But what happened is, is I had a computer in one hand, had a bag on my shoulder, and I had a, my other hand filled with uh, this. It was a cup that was filled with all of this stuff that was for an event that we were doing with the team. But I had just this craving, like I needed a donut now. Come on, have you ever had one of those where like, I need it right now? How many here have ever started eating something before it was all the way out of the refrigerator? That was kind of the mode I was in, you know. I, and so as I'm reaching for the donut, the, the, re, the reality was is that I went to grab the donut. I realized I had something in my hand, and of course, I didn't have time to put it down. And so I, I did one of those, you know, like stick your finger in the middle of the hole, try to get the donut and try to eat it. It was like, and so as I do this process of trying to grab and reach out for the donut, I... I I, I, I kind of run over to the, you know, if you've ever had a cinnamon crumb donut, they're the most messy donut of all donuts. Um, and uh, I run over to the trash can because I don't want it to spill on the floor because everyone's coming in. And as I'm starting to eat the donut, I realize that everything that was in the cup is spilled all over the floor. Because the point is, is you can't grab a hold of the new if you're still trying to hold on to the now. You may not be able to get a hold of the next season or the next thing that God wants to bring if you try to cling to what you're holding now. And what's interesting is that this verse tells us that people are missing out. I'm going to dive into this a little more later. They're missing out on some of the good things that God has for them, and it's because they're clingers. What are you clinging to? And here's the danger. What we cling to can easily turn into an idol. Something that's more important than what God says. For some of us, maybe you're clinging and your idol is offense. Maybe for some of us, the idol that has, has become an idol because we clung tightly to it is unforgiveness. Maybe the idol is control. Come on, how many here have ever struggled with control? A lot of you, because you wouldn't even raise your hand. You're, you're too in control. For some of us, the idol could be money, our resources. For, for Jonah, it was prejudice, because he didn't like the Ninevites. He didn't want God to bless the Ninevites. So he clung, and it turned into an idol. And the point I want to make today is there's a lot of us that, that may be missing, forfeiting the love, the grace, the power, the miracles, the, the blessings of God. And it's not because God doesn't love us, and it's not because we don't love God, but it's because we become clingers. And the key the Scripture teaches us here is that we have to let go. And in fact, in the very next verse, the very next point kind of shows how that happens. And and it even not only shows how it happens, but it's the breakthrough that everything changes. Because the very next verse tells us that God orders the fish and the fish spits him out onto the shore. And he literally takes a whole new direction in life. Because first of all, he realizes I can't cling. I can't hold tightly to what's become more important than God. Let let me read it to you. Let me give the second point because the first point is reach out through letting go. The second point is reach out through sacrificial generosity. Reach out through sacrificial generosity. Look at what it says in the verse. Those who cling to things that have become more important than God, they forfeit God's love. So here's what he says. So this is what I'm going to do. But I'm going to do differently. So what do I do? He says, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. The word sacrifice there is the Hebrew word worship, but here's what it means. It means to 
to cut or to kill in those days when you came to the house of God for your moment of worship, you know what you would do? You wouldn't sing songs with guitars. You would give an offering. You would give. In fact, that's why David said, I don't ever come before the house of God empty-handed. So you'd come and you would offer, and here's how you do it. You would take the living thing that you were holding on to, and you would sacrifice. In other words, sometimes when it comes to giving to God, sometimes when it comes to generosity, it it costs something. It might even hurt a little bit. Come on, how many of you have ever had God tell you to be generous? And and you you were generous, but it, it hurt. It cost something. So here's what he says. He says, so that I don't forfeit the love of God, here's what I'll do. Instead of clinging, I'm going to let go with sacrificial generosity. I'm going to do it gratefully sh- with shouts of praise. I'm not going to do it grudgingly or angrily. I'm going to do it instead. I'm going to do it with a cheerful heart, with a heart of praise. And then the very next verse says, and then the Lord told the fish. The miracle came on the other side of reaching out through letting go sacrificial generosity. Come on, y'all still with me? Just say amen. Amen. This is a powerful principle that's right in the middle of Jonah. I never knew it was there as I was studying the the, the book. I, I didn't even know this powerful generosity of giving was there. And so what I want to do now, since I've given you the two points, I want to digress a little bit and I want to tell you and show you a story in the Bible and through my own personal story, how God does this and why he does this. Why does he call us to generosity? Why does he call us to give to things like we're asking you to do, to missions, to give generously above and beyond in some way? Why does he do it? And and the Lord showed it to me this week. So I have a circle. Let me just say, everyone in our church, one of the things we want you to do is get in a circle somewhere. Get in in a a small group of people that are praying and encouraging each other, whether it's a, a community circle or a study circle or an outreach circle. We want you plugged in somewhere. And uh, I'm in a circle, and one of the circles I'm in is a prayer group of men called The Wall. And so we gather every week and we pray. And one of the things these men do is they're kind of like, remember the story when Moses was trying to hold up his hands so that the victory could be won? And Aaron and Hur came along and held his hands up because his arms got tired. These guys are like my Aaron and Hur. They're there and they hold my hands up and they pray with me. And when things are coming, we literally show up and and one of the guys says, okay, pastor, here's our prayer list. Is there anything we need to add to it? And we'll begin to pray. And one of the things we prayed over was this giving campaign to reach into the nations, to raise $200,000 for missions. And, and I want you to know something. We don't just do these things and, hey, that's cool, and we move on. We, we pray about it. I, I'm believing for it. I'm talking to God about it every day because I know that if we reach our goal, we're going to be able to build orphanages. We're going to be able to plant churches. We're going to be able to share the gospel. Lives are going to be changed. And so we're praying about it. These guys are praying with me. And so as we begin to pray, one of the men in the group prayed this prayer. And this is where I want to tell you the story. As he begins to pray, he says, God, you see that we're believing for 200,000 in commitments And he said, so I ask you, God, right now, speak to the people that have the resources. Speak to their hearts that have the resources. God, that we can meet this goal and we can touch the nations and share the gospel. And as soon as he said it, I just had one of those Holy Ghost downloads. Have you ever had one of those Holy Spirit downloads where God just speaks to you? And it's like, and here's the cool thing about God. When he speaks to you, it's almost like he tells all of it to you in just a split second. It's like an instant knowing. It's an instant revelation. And that's what happened to me. And when he said these words, in fact, this gentleman is up at man camp right now. With, we've got over 120 men up there, and they're going after God. It's awesome. And he, and he began to pray. And as he began to pray, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me about someone who was tempted to cling, but chose to let go and to sacrificially be generous. And it's a story about a woman. Her name was, uh, well, we don't know her name, but she was a widow and she was from a town called Zarephath. Now, here's what you need to know. God spoke to Elijah and here's what he said. This is what what God's telling me while I'm in this moment of prayer. And here's the story. God said to Elijah, because there was a famine in the land, right? No no rain or whatever. And so God said, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to cause the ravens to feed you. How many have heard that story? So he said, go to the brook Cherith. So literally, check this out. Elijah goes to the brook Cherith. He's hanging out there. And every day, 
God sends um, supernatural Grubhub. Every day, um, ravens fly in with Chick-fil-A. I mean, it's awesome. Think about it. I mean, literally every day, Chick-fil-A. Now, I don't know how they carried the sauce. That's kind of confusing. But, but they brought in the chicken every day. He's getting fed by the raven, raven's meat, the Bible says. And he's drinking from the, the, the stream. Well, eventually the stream runs out of water. And he's now not able to have water. And so God says, okay, I'm going to provide for you again. And here's how you're going to do it. You're going to go to Zarephath. And there's a widow there. And I'm commanding her to provide for the kingdom for you. Now, first of all, let me just say that's pretty interesting because first of all, Zarephath is not in Israel. So he's saying, you're going to go to the land of the Philistines, your enemy. You're going to get out of your comfort zone. You're going to leave where you are. And I've commanded a widow to provide for you at Zarephath. And so he shows up to, to Zarephath. He sees the widow. She's on her way. She's getting ready actually to make a meal. And when he sees her, he says, hey, would you make me some food? And she looks at him and she says, I'm sorry, sir, but I can't do that because you see, I only have a little bit in my hand. I got a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour. I just got a little bit. In fact, not even enough because here's what I was going to do. I was going to make a meal. My son and I were going to eat it and then we're going to die because we have no more food and there's famine and we have no more money and we don't know what we're going to do. And then audaciously, crazy, prophet looks at her and says, no, 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 no. Here's what you need to do. That little bit that you have, give it to God. What? I mean, she's a widow. We're supposed to take care of the widows. God says, give her, give to the kingdom first. Now, now we know, and I'll read this to you in a minute, but let me just stop and say, I started immediately in that moment as I was praying. I'm like, God, here's a question I ask God. I, I ask these questions all the time. I'm like, God, why did, you, why did you expect and want a widow with nothing to give? You could have easily picked somebody wealthy in Jerusalem or in Israel. Why didn't you pick the wealthy? I mean, I just heard someone pray, God, speak to the ones with resources. Why didn't you have a, a wealthy man and in Israel that was close by where he wasn't in danger being in the enemy's camp and the enemy's territory, not a widow that was literally making her last meal. She had almost nothing. You want her to give? Why did you choose her when you could have chosen someone with with money? And as I began to dive into this story and as God began to speak to me, I began to realize that God chose her for a reason. You see, God chose the widow. He chose the one that didn't have much for a few reasons. I think one of the reasons is that because sometimes you and I, even though we don't have much, we don't value what we do have. We think what we have doesn't matter. We think the little bit that we have doesn't really make a difference. But here's what you need to know. Whether it's little or a lot, in the eyes of God, what you have makes a difference. And what you do with it makes a difference. And so what happens is is God begins to deal with this woman. I'll tell you why he chose this woman, why I believe, and it's clearly in Scripture, I believe. But why did he choose this woman in a minute? But first of all, what he begins to do is he begins to deal with her hand because it's easy to cling to things. You see, she was clinging, and what she had in her hand had become an idol because here's here's what an idol is. Anything that is more important to you than what God says. That's what I believe an idol is. And so he deals with her idol. And can I show you what it is? Let's go to, go to 1 Kings. So she says, I can't. I don't have much. And what, is, what does God say through the prophet to her? He deals with the idol. Don't be afraid. Let me stop right there. Some of us, you know, we've closed our hand on our finances. And here's why. Because we become more scared about what we have and it lasting than we are trusting God who made the hand that we're holding it in. You see, her fear of, well, I don't have enough. Her fear of, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. Her fear of, well, if I give to God, then there's not enough left over. But God begins to deal with the idol. He says, listen, you've allowed fear to be more important than understanding that 
I'm the provider. I'm the one who's given you everything you have. I'm the one that can give you the resources you need through the middle of your famine. I'm the one that created your hand. I'm the one that created the pot that you're holding. I'm the one that provides it all. So instead of clinging to your idol, trust the one who created you. See, some of us, it's fear. There are many people, I had someone come to me last week and they have not tithed and God spoke to them about tithing. And the real reason they haven't is because of fear and fear has become their idol. And so what the scripture is teaching us through Jonah is we, we don't cling, we let go and we do it sacrificially. And look what he says. He says, if you'll deal with your fear and you'll go ahead and do what, what you said, make the food, but make a little bread first for, for the kingdom. You give to God first. If you'll trust God first, look what God says. Then use what's left over to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. Because here's what's going to happen. For this is what the Lord says. The God of Israel says there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. Why didn't God choose a wealthy person to provide for, for the kingdom? You see, we think that when God tells us to give, that God's doing it because, first of all, he needs our money. And sometimes, if we're honest, we think he's doing it just to kind of keep us in line or to hurt us. But here's the thing. God chose the widow because... He didn't want to hurt her. He wanted to help her. Because he knew that if she could let go of what had become an idol, if she could give generously, it was going to be the means for him to provide for her through the entire famine. Aren't you thankful that God loved the widow instead of going to the rich guy? He chose the widow because... Generosity was the vehicle that God was using to bring what she needed in her life. And we think that generosity is going to hurt us, but generosity is the key that God uses to break idols in our life. But number two, it's the vehicle to release God's divine grace and provision into every aspect of our life. Here's what I love. Listen to this. Because here's the thing. God said, I'll provide all your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And we always think that means money. Can I tell you, there's going to come a day in your life where you need more than money. There might be a day that comes when you need peace. There might be a day that comes when you need healing. There might be a day that comes when you need a wayward child to come home. You see, here's what the widow didn't know that God knew. Here's what, the, what God knew that even the prophet didn't know. God chose this widow because he knew First of all, she needed food through the famine. But number two, he knew that her son was going to die. And if you read the story, after God's providing food and through the famine, her son gets sick and dies. And you see, the reason God chose her to give was because he knew that when the day came that her son died, she was going to need a prophet who happened to be there with her that could go into the room and pray over him and, and speak the word of life over him and prophesy breath into his body for him to come back to life. You see, here's the thing. The reason God wants us to be generous and wants us to not cling to idols because he knows what you need before you even know you need it. And he uses your generosity as a vehicle to provide. What does he say? When we cling, we forfeit the love and divine grace of God. So God challenges us to give generously. Why? Because he's setting you up to provide for what you need. It may be a healing. It may be for a marriage to come back together again. It may be for a son to come home. But what happened? When she needed her son, God brought the provision. So I'm sitting there in this prayer meeting, and God just whoo, downloads all this into my mind. Because I'll be honest with you, there are people that will leave a service like this and say, can you believe that, Pastor? There, there are women there that are widows that are on fixed incomes. And he has the audacity to challenge them to give generously when their budget is tight. And it may be, a, it may be a very difficult. It may be 
very hard, challenging, maybe impossible. How, how can God ask us to do something like that? Well, let me just say it's because God isn't wanting to hurt you. God is wanting to position you so that he can release into your life every miracle that you don't even know you need. So I'm, I'm sitting there. Amen. Amen. And so the Lord says to me, what do you have in your hand, Jared? And uh, I started thinking and I realized that I had something in my hand, but I was clinging to it. I'm going to get a little transparent here for a second, so you guys will just bear with me. I've shared with this congregation on a few occasions that I have a prodigal son. And uh, he's gone to a faraway land. Um, it's still here in Valencia, but it feels like a faraway land. Because he's on the street and he's not making good decisions and not willing to surrender and follow the Lord and do those kinds of things. And it's been tough. Tough for him, tough for our family. And as we were sitting there, two things happened. One is, when he prayed that prayer, God, speak to those with resources. One of the things God said, what do you have in your hand? Just like the widow. And I realized at that moment that I have a little bit of money. And that money has been set aside for a purpose. And that purpose was to one day when my son was ready and mature enough and all whatever to help him get a car. And so I've been holding on to it tightly because it's the thing that means he's going to come back. Things are going to get better. And then one day when things are better and he's proved himself, then I'm going to bless him. And, and so I got to make sure I have that money because there'll come a day that I'm going to need that money. And that's what the devil tells us all the time, right? That's what the widow said. Well, there's going to come a day I'm going to need this, so I need it. And so we cling on to it. We hold it tightly. Now, this sum is like 10 times what I've ever committed in a year to missions, almost 10 times. And then God said to me, he said, are you going to cling or are you going to let go? And I realize there's a whole lot going on in my head. It's not just about the money. It's about control. It's about fear. It's about all the idols. Because I'm a guy who likes things to be in control. And I got no control right now. I got none. And so the Lord says, you need to give it. I'm commanding you to give to the kingdom. I'm commanding you to let go and to reach out. You can help reach that goal on a whole other level than you've ever known before. And as I began to, as he began to speak to me about that, suddenly he reminded me of what happened with the widow. You see, she gave and she obeyed, and because she gave and she obeyed, God gave her her son back. So suddenly I said, okay, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to peel my fingers back. Come on, have you ever been there? And I'm going to be generous. And I, and I stopped and I, I told the guys at the end, I'm like, guys, listen, I feel like the Lord spoke, me to, spoke to me to do this generous commitment and it's this money that I've set aside for something else and, and, um, and I feel like I'm supposed to give it, but I need to get confirmation from the Holy Spirit. And they're like, we understand. So I, I, that means I need to talk to my wife. Mind me knowing something about it. Don't go make a pledge without talking to your spouse. Come on, somebody say amen. Or you might have to go to the marriage care center. Just want you to know you'd be in trouble. So I get home and I say to my wife, I say, Devette, here's what the Lord began. I, as soon as I just start to even say it, I didn't even go through the rationale. She said, yes, yes, yes. Now I'm going to tell you something. We're not going to give this so we can get our son back. We're going to give this because, number one, I want to obey God. But number two, I don't want to be one of these kind of people. God's always fighting with my fingers. He's always fighting with my idols. See, we don't value what we have. Every one of us has something that you can do 
It's something you could give. We, we could blow that number away if everybody did something. But here's the problem. The devil jumps in our mind and he tweaks us and says, well, I got this and we got this project and I need this and, well, I got to save this because eventually and pretty soon it's fear or it's justification or it's, it's prejudice or it's whatever it is. And then the next thing you know, we're still holding on. And then we wonder why we don't see the miracles that we could see. We wonder why sons and daughters aren't coming home. We wonder why miracles don't take place. Why? Because the Bible says if we cling to our idols, we will forfeit the love and grace of God. I don't want to forfeit the grace of God. I don't want to shut down the flow of the grace of God. I want to release the divine grace of God to do and be, to receive all that he's planned for me. And even the things that I don't know I need. So I'm not giving to get my son back, but if God can do it for a widow, God can do it for me. And God can do it for you. I'll end with this, and I, I'm already going long. Children's ministry is going to get mad at me again. Oh, man. I had a woman come up to me after service last night. I'll be honest with you, sometimes if I share something like this, I go home and I'm like, God, I hope people understand my heart. I hope they know I'm not, I want you to know something. I'm not trying to manipulate you today. I'm not trying to tell you some sad story. I'm not trying to take some Bible verse to get you to do something you don't want to do. It's not my heart. I believe what I'm saying. I believe it so much I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. Because I am not going to let an idol control me. Widow comes up, not a widow, I'm sorry, a young lady comes up to me. She said, Pastor Jay, I, wanted, I want you to tell my story. I said, okay, what's your story? She said, I was here last weekend when you started talking about reaching. You talked about generosity. She said, you know my situation. We've been kind of homeless, living in different places, estranged from her husband, struggling with, there's addiction issues there and she said, things have been tight for us, very difficult. She said, last week you shared about generosity and giving. And she said, basically, in hearing the story, I had $75 left for the whole week. And that was supposed to be our gas money and our food money. And she said, you began to talk and the Lord said, you need to give to missions. So she said, I gave $25 to missions last week. She goes, and I left, and I was like, okay, Lord, I've got $50. You, you take that $50, and you stretch it out, God. I'm going to trust you. She said, and so I went to the grocery store, and I bought, like, the cheapest stuff that would last the longest, and I only spent $10. And as I was walking out with my kids from the store, there was a woman on the side of the road with the, right by the entrance with a sign. And as I walked out and I saw her, I felt like the Holy Spirit, you need to give. I'm like, God, I can't give. I already gave to the church. I only have $40 left. It's got to last all week. God, I can't. You know, it's just, it's, I'm afraid. What if I don't have enough? What if I can't feed my kids? What if these crackers and all this stuff go, if we don't get through it all, and then we're hungry. What are we going to do, God? And we, and we, she said, so I did what I think we all do is I got in the car and I drove around the block and played, prayed about it. Come on, how many of you have ever done that? She's like, okay, okay, God, you want me to do something? She said, I'm going to give $20. So I had two 20s. So I drove, started driving back up to the, the store, and my son starts going, we're not going shopping again, are we, Mom? We already did that once. She's like, no, no, stay in the car. She said, so I get in, out of the car, and I walk up to this lady. And she said, I reached into my purse, and God said, nope, do it all. She said, I gave all $40 I had. And she said countenance of this woman and the opportunity to share with her and pray with her and all this. It was a beautiful thing. And she said, I got back in the car and I'm like, okay, God, I don't know what to do. She said, Pastor Jared, she started crying. She said, Pastor Jared, she goes, the very next day, my spouse who is not given spousal support and child support and all that, suddenly, out of the blue, a $1,200 wire was transferred to my account from my spouse the very next morning. Come on, God deserves a better praise than that. Are we not thankful for the goodness and the grace of God? And she said, not only do I have that $1,200, but 
On Monday, I'm going to someone who has talked to us about maybe setting up an apartment that we can get for our family at a really great price. With the challenges I've had, it's tough to get someone to even allow us to have the chance. And I'm believing that Monday is going to be the rest of the miracle. Why would God ask someone to give what little bit they have? Is God some sadistic God that just wants to take from people? No. God chose the widow because he wanted her to realize that what she had, it matters. Value what you've been given. The little bit you have may not seem like a lot, but guess what? If you, if you give or if you honor God in the process, he'll use it not only to bless others, but he'll use it to position you for the day that comes when you need God to provide. I want you to close your eyes.